Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to lecture five uh, of English 1120, uh, Time and History in Literature. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the theme of, of time in Old English literature. But uh, first, I'd like to go through some housekeeping, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, housekeeping items. Just uh, so last week, everyone did a good job of um, of doing their first assignment. Everyone understood the uh, what was expected. So uh, congratulations on that. Uh, next week will be reading week, so I don't expect to see anyone hopefully here. I won't be here. Uh, so as per the title of reading week, I would expect that you would catch up on the readings for both this course and, and any other courses that you have. Uh, the week after that, we'll be studying Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, and that week as well, you'll have the second assignment due. So the second assignment is similar to the first one, except rather than talking about either the Homer or, or Virgil, your choices will be tonight's readings in Old English poetry or Shakespeare's sonnets, which we'll study in two weeks time. Um, any questions about the housekeeping items, about what we can expect over the next couple of weeks? So again, uh, raise your hands or, or let me know in, a, in the chat. Okay, uh, so hearing none, uh, I'll proceed with, uh, with back to the subject matter. We'll uh, maybe just recap what we've done so far uh, in the course. Um, so we started by talking about the theme of the course being, being time and history, obviously in literature and talked about the nature of narrative, uh, narrative functioning as a, as a principle that, uh, that uh, cut across and was deeply tied to both time and history. Uh, and, and both time and history kind of are revealed in narrative and narrative itself has a, has a temporal dimension. So we saw, saw that at play in, in Homer, first of all, I don't, we, we talked about a few things there, but I'll just underscore how in Homer, uh, the narration of uh, the prophecy that, Odys the, that Odysseus receives is by the time it's narrated already his fate. So, so prophecy as narrated becomes one's fate in the Odyssey. And we saw in Virgil in a number of ways in, in both book six in the way there's a the pageant of the future presented before Aeneas. There's, there's the shield. We didn't have a chance to talk about that, but the shield of Aeneas that's talked about in book eight. There's the, um, the prophecies he receives in, um, in a number of different occasions before uh, book six and book eight. In all these senses, the prophecies of the future are the future for Aeneas but are really the already achieved political destiny of Rome. So again, the narrative, the narration takes this prophecy and turns it into kind of the fated uh, destiny, this time of a political ent entity rather than the individual. Um, so that's uh, those two classical epics we looked at very briefly. Um, now, as we move on to uh, some, some shorter lyrics, poetry. So we're going to look at the Old English poetry and those again two short lyrics that we're looking at. And then Shakespeare also, uh, Shakespeare's sonnets are a form of short lyric poetry written quite a bit later than uh, the Old English poetry. But in both of those instances we'll turn to a different sense of, of the theme of time in literature. Uh, more so we'll look at the question of temporality and the passage of time and, and the experience, human experience of that and how, how that confronts one with a sense of loss and how can one try to preserve one's uh, or pre hold on to some sort of stability or identity in the face of that ceaseless change. So we, we see that strikingly, I think, in um, The Wanderer, most, most importantly. So we'll try to emphasize that tonight. And then uh, in, in Shakespeare's sonnets, we'll see that in terms of what are often called the procreation sonnets and what are some, 
solutions for trying to overcome time is really the problem, the, the passage of time and how it decays all things and how all things die and, and are lost through time. So how do we overcome that and try to find a meaning or a permanence in time? So those are kind of an, an, an enduring problem in um, well, human existence and, and experience, but in, an enduring problem of literature it's, itself. As earliest literature we have, so just on that theme, the earliest literature that we have records of is the is the epic of Gilgamesh, and that's the fundamental problem of of, of Gilgamesh is trying to find a meaning of, uh, after the death of his friend Enkidu, trying to find uh, the key to immortality. He realizes that's not something that humans are meant to have access to, and and his solution is to build the the walls of Ur, and and, and that becomes kind of a a lasting public monument of something that will last longer than his brief time. And will that provide a meaning for the hero's existence? Uh, and of course, there are other answers, uh, other heroic achievements to find uh, to find something that endures past one's meager existence, one's own meager time. Uh, in the procreation sonnets that we'll turn to, the answer is, well, a preliminary answer perhaps is children, you know, so people say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be around here for a little bit, but maybe I'll have children and, and that will be a way in which in, in, in some small measure, my identity will live beyond my, my brief time here. And uh, I think in, in Shakespeare's sonnets, we'll see that's um, superseded by other, other ways of overcoming time, but it's one answer that's put forward. And it's, a, as I say, it's, the question of human experience, the question people face all the times in their lives, you know, what, what's the purpose, you know, what's going to, it's going to be left after I'm gone, you know, that's going to have any worth, if anything, you know, that I do or, 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 or perform. Um, and, and children is, is often, uh, or the decision to have children is often uh, one that uh, people naturally turn to for that. So that's the kind of a recap of the theme of time and history and literature that we've covered so far and what we're going to cover in the next couple of weeks. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to um, turn to the presentation that I've prepared on old English literature. So uh, the, um, the presentation is, as we'll see, provides a historical context of Old English literature. So we're, we're quite a bit removed uh, from the classical literature we were looking at, and uh, both geographically and temporally. So, so we'll just fill in a little bit that context. Not as, we won't go into as much detail in the context as we did for Virgil. I thought the Virgil, Virgil context is super essential for understanding Virgil. Here, just some refresher of where we are historically and, and as I said, geographically. I wanna talk a bit about uh, what we could call the medieval synthesis. So uh, the medieval sy synthesis of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And on the one hand, a tradition of revelation or, or, or basing or putting faith in, into the revealed word and the, the tradition of uh, Greek philosophy or reason on the other side. So, uh, so the Middle Ages basically achieved this uh, this synthesis or seeing that the complementarity of the two and that one could live in accordance uh, with both calls, so to speak, to live the good life. Um, the, uh, then we'll get into the talk about the dream of the rude, the first poem I asked you to, to read. It's in translation with Old English. We'll talk quickly about that when we get to the dream of the rude, but Old English is essentially a foreign language to us now. So we wanted get a sense of what that looks like, but uh, what you read was a, was a modern translation of that. We'll look at the literary genres and then we'll look very briefly at the models of heroism and dream of the rude. Uh, then we'll get to the wanderer uh, and talk about this question of ubi sunt, which is where are they now in Latin, which is this motif that comes up there of, 
a way of confronting the passing of time in terms of that loss and where are these things that I so cherished in the past. So here's uh, our, where we are on our, our temporal, uh, temporal scheme here. You can see we'll be, we'll be shifting ahead from, from the Aeneid here written just before the turn of the first millennium to uh, the Dream of the Root and the Wanderer written around 800, 900 of the common era. So several hundred years later, uh, uh, a, a, so a big gap, we're, uh, we're, we're jumping over there. Um, and in terms of this diagram of periods of literature, you'll see we'll, we're also jumping from the ancient period, which is kind of pre-English pre literature per se, to the earliest form of English literature that we have available to us. So let's talk a little bit about the context, the historical context. Um, as you can see the, through the map on the right there, this is um, a representation of some migrations happening during the Anglo-Saxon invasions. But before that, um, uh, in the heyday of the Roman Empire, uh, uh, Britannia was a, uh, a, a province of the Roman Empire from around 50 to 410 of the Common Era. So there's fort settlements there, coexisting with the indigenous peoples of the island. So these peoples are, are Celts, um, different varieties of Celts. And uh, the Romans were forced to withdraw um, uh, the, these these troops and these fort settlements uh, from Britannia uh, as they were uh, under pressure in the continent and, and in Italy from Germanic invaders. So, uh, so these Germanic invaders are coming from the north, uh, the northeast and they're, they're pressing down to, to what is now France, they're pressing down into what is uh, northern Italy, um, etc. So um, the Romans are trying to uh, fortify their holdings there with more troops, so they have to call them back from Britannia. This leaves the field open, so to speak, for uh, other Germanic tribes to migrate from Northern Europe into what is now uh, Great Britain. Um, and uh, as the Anglo-Saxons did that, and this is what the map's representing, uh, uh, as the Anglo-Saxons did that, the, the, the native Celts migrated westward, so into territories that are now Wales, uh, 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 Cornish settlements in the, this, this tip here of, of, um, of, of Britain, as well as to territories in, um, on the continent. So there's, uh, there are Celtic settlements here on the distant, distant Celtic um, routes in the, uh, on the continent from that migration. And this is basically the lay of the land until, and this is in terms of the next big invasion, the next big wave of migration would be from the Norman conquest of 1066, okay? So that old, that old English period or that Anglo-Saxon period is kind of framed by the, those two invasions. So Anglo-Saxon invasions, which are more migrations, it's not just one invasion. And then the Norman conquest in 1066 on the other side. So here's kind of a, a more of a bird's eye view geographically of what we're talking about. This is the Roman Empire at about its greatest extent uh, in early in the second century of the common era. And, and of course, you can see the Brit Britannia uh, settlements there. But quite a distance from Rome. I'm not sure what we're talking about in kilometers there, but uh, you know, a distant outpost. And remember how we talked about, uh, let's go back for a second, as Rome expanded, that was part of uh, what necessitated or, or, or contributed to the decline of Republican liberties, et cetera, was the necessity to have uh, distant armies with, with generals with long tenures of command, loyalty to those generals being um, uh, uh, 
be becoming enforced and then the emperors uh, making the, those armies basically loyal to the emperor. Um, so uh, the Roman legacy, you, there's still extensive uh, ruins in Britain from the Roman legacy there, okay? So, so there's an, ex as with every territory they conquered, there's extensive network of roads, sanitation and water systems, the establishment of what would become major cities at the time were more modest villages, but London, Manchester, York. Uh, they brought Christianity to the island, but it needed to be reestablished after the Anglo-Saxons, because the Anglo-Saxons came with their own pagan religion. Um, and what's curious about, about, uh, uh, about Roman, Roman occupation in Britain is that they didn't leave a legacy of their language. So their, their Latin language in the other areas that they settled, so Spain, Gaul, which became France, et cetera, they, their Latin language left an uh, imprint in terms of the Romance languages that are spoken right now. So they have uh, these, the, these different kind of regional dialects of Latin became through evolution and mixture with, with with other uh, other tribes there, uh, what are known as those Romance languages that share so much common uh, so common vocabulary and structure with with Latin itself. We, did, we didn't get that as a root originally with English. Um, uh, Old English uh, is a Germanic language, as, as we'll talk about very quickly, and uh, any Latin Latinate words that we have come after the Norman conquest of 1066. So the 1066 conquest by these Norman French conquerors brought with them French language and, and the Latin roots of that. So, so but the, the kind of the bedrock of English is this Germanic language with a kind of a, a superstructure of learned words um, borrowed from French and Latin after the, after the Norman conquest. Um, So this is a representation of where these different tribes are coming from. So we have Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Frisians in, in what is now uh, Holland, Northern Germany, uh, Denmark, the, these regions, the Low Countries. So uh, <clears throat> uh, a combination of the same kind of migrations westward that were putting pressure on the Roman Empire with putting pressure on these tribes as well. So they, uh, they, they sought greener pastures and um, uh, found their way onto to the vacated uh, British Isles. Um, the, the Angles uh, settling here, uh, Saxons in, in, in different regions here, the Jutes here and, and a little bit here, and, and then some English Franks here. So the uh, <clears throat> so the as you can see there the the kingdom of they form these little kingdoms there and the Jutes form this kingdom of Kent and then the Saxons form these all the all the regions that have uh, sex in, as the as the root there not the sex you're thinking of but that's from Sax that's from Saxon it's the a linguistic uh, a trait of those regions so. Wessex is West Saxon, okay, and Sussex is South Saxon, and uh, Essex, Essex is East Saxon. And the Angles formed the kingdoms uh, of Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, and from the Angles we have the, the term England and English. Um, and then, of course, unlike the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons did leave a lasting linguistic imprint on the, on the island. Um, so a little bit about uh, about uh, Anglo-Saxon culture, Old English culture, um, the basically this relationship of a thane and a lord, a thane and a king. So this this uh, this basically a chief or lord who has these um, thanes or or um, uh, what in a medieval system might be called knights, but uh, they, they're not necessarily 
all the connotations of having to have armor or fighting, etc. But they need to be loyal to that king. The king's job, the, the chief's job is to be generous with any spoils that that have been acquired through conquest or through what, whatever means uh, is to be generous with these and, and to be a, a giver uh, to the, the people that are uh, uh, in, in, in his sway and they're there to be loyal and fight for him and, and, um, and, and do his bidding, obviously. And in terms of uh, cultural location and, and a, a symbol for a symbol for their, their community locus, the meat hall figures quite large, both well in the literature uh, as, as kind of the literary artifact of, of how they live uh, that's available to us. So in the literature, the mead hall stands, uh, stands prominently. We see that in the wanderer. He, he, he thinks back to the mead hall. He thinks back to the, his generous Lord. He thinks, oh, I wish it was still there. I wish I was still with, with, with that generous Lord. That's all gone now. All of my, my companions are gone. The mead hall is gone. Uh, so the, it's the king's residence and it's kind of a court, but it's where they would also have large, uh, large feasts, you know, some carousing, there's some, there's a few filmic representations of an old English epic called Beowulf that uh, kind of represent the, the, the high spirited uh, drinking and carousing that you can imagine would have happened in, in the meat hall. Uh, just a quick word about the religion. So they came with their own pagan beliefs. They have this belief in fate or weird. Uh, for those of you who've read uh, Macbeth, so the, there's the three witches in Macbeth, they're referred to as weird sisters. So that word, the English word weird and the weird sisters in Macbeth is a direct reference to this old English word for fate. So these are sisters that know the fates, they know the future. Um, so they worship different Germanic gods and from, from whom we get our Four of our days of the week. We, uh, the other three are from uh, from uh, various terms for uh, uh, cosmic bodies. So, so from Tuesday we get this. Uh, Tuesday we get from their god of war, Tu, and Wednesday we get from Woden, uh, is the chief of the gods. Thor's Thor is of course uh, Thursday. Um, and Freya, uh, Woden's wife, uh, is we get from from her we get Friday. And then of course Saturday from Saturn and Sunday from the sun, Monday from the moon. Okay, so lundi in French. Uh, so uh, those three are not directly from these um, from these uh, <clears throat> Anglo-Saxon God. So. Christianity is brought starting in the, uh, the late sixth century, but more so in the, the seventh century and um, brings it, so it kind of comes into conflict with this Germanic ethos of, of kind of a warrior culture uh, with this ethos of peace. We have written literature brought for the first time, a kind of a, a culture built on education of this kind of monk class that act as scribes. They act as scribes, for writing down history of oral tales, but also uh, a lot of the literature, like uh, example Beowulf uh, that I mentioned, and as a as also this ecclesiastical history of the English people. So at an early time, we have a history of of some conflicts, some legendary, some some maybe helpful historically. So now I want to talk about the medieval synthesis. So this is a bit broader than just the English context, but uh, let's say uh, Europe, uh, uh, North Africa more generally, uh, in terms of how um, one reconciles the two, let's say two competing claims, which uh, in, in terms of what is the, the best way to lead one's life. So if we listen to the Greek philosophers, the best way to lead one's life is uh, through my own unaided reason, to rationally try to articulate what is virtue, what is the good, and then follow that path using, again, my basis 
being reason. And then if we follow the Judeo-Christian tradition based on the revealed word of God, the, the what is the good life there is, is quite different. There, the good life is to follow, uh, follow uh, God's law as revealed in these texts, what, what God has, um, has, has commanded us to do and to, to fulfill our aspect of the covenant, okay? So our unaided reason is less, um, well, it's not at stake at all there if you take an extreme view of that, of that claim. So how do these two, two uh, claims of what is the good life, how can they be reconciled? Today, sometimes that, let's say that dichotomy reveals itself in the faith versus science or the, the, the debates with the new atheists. I think that that's a slightly different spin on that than, than what would have been happening in the Middle Ages, but it's similar. Okay, so do we approach the truth through our own unaided reason or, or revelation? So one way of thinking about it, I like, uh, I think the, the uh, person's name is Philip Carey, a, a professor in the, the, the States, has, has, uh, has likened the tradition, the Western tradition, to a, a body, one with two legs, so the, that are the, the kind of the foundation of that body, how they stand, where, where they're where they're rooted to the ground. And one leg is, is, is represents the Greco-Roman tradition, the classical tradition. One leg representing the Judeo-Christian tradition. And then they become united in the torso, which could be, let's say, the, the Middle Ages, this medieval synthesis we're trying to get a bit of a handle on. And then the two arms could represent the Renaissance on the one hand. So one arm uh, points downward, it tries to reroute itself in the classical tradition, tries to, let's say, bypass the, the torso, the Middle Ages, and try to reroute itself in the classics and, and try to have a rebirth of those classics. And the other hand, the, the Reformation tries to reroute itself in the Judeo-Christian tradition and, and separate itself from a tradition of interpretations that may have accreted itself upon that, that kind of original uh, biblical revelation and maybe blinding us from, from that original. And then in, according to this analogy, the, 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 the head represents modernity. It's, it's enlightenment. It's about, about uh, scientific inquiry. Um, so, so let's, what are these two legs then? What, what, what's up with these two things? So, <clears throat> so uh, we, in the Greek tradition, we get the birth of philosophy, kind of the beginnings of science, so to speak. Um, and I think we, we need to understand that in the context of their, pre, their overarching understanding of the cosmos that preceded that. So for the Greeks, the gods exist within a pre-existing cosmos, an eternal cosmos that's subject to Moira or fate. Um, and so the gods are knowable in human, human terms. <clears throat> um, so because of that, we could say grounding human life and determining what the good life is, is a matter of coming to know the cosmos because, because the gods themselves are knowable, the cosmos to some extent is knowable. So if we can come to know beings as a whole as, as completely as possible, that would appear to be the way to try to guide our lives. We don't have any other source of, of wisdom that's beyond the cosmos to guide us. <clears throat> so philosophy would arise seemingly naturally as, as the, the response to the human need to have a definitive account of the whole in order to guide our life. So uh, in the Hebrew Chist tradition, in contrast, like we might want to start thinking start our thinking by looking at the divine name. So in Exodus 3.14, <clears throat> uh, God is, is, is telling uh, Moses that he, he needs to go and, and free the people from, uh, uh, from Egypt, the, 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 the Israelites that are in, in, enslaved there, and uh, said, you know, they're not going to listen to me, you know, who am I? And, and he says, but it also, who am I going to say sent me? What's your name? So this is the first time God reveals his name. And he says, Ehye Asher Ehye, which uh, can be translated as I shall be what I shall be. Okay. So 
because it's there's no distinction between the future and present tense in, in that biblical Hebrew, it could be translated as I am what I am or I will be what I will be. Um, so I, I like the future tense translation because it, it really emphasizes this notion that God's saying, we make covenants, but I'm not predictable. It's not as though, as in these other polytheistic religions, where if you do this, you have a charm and control me and will be able to predict me. I will be what I will be. I am unpredictable. I'm unknowable. I am a mystery. Okay. Um, so, so it emphasizes in that way, let's say, the, mis the mystery of the divine, the unknowable nature of the divine. And given that, given that we have, a, let's say, a God that stands outside the cosmos, that creates the cosmos, um, unlike the Greeks. Uh, the good life, we could say, consists in trying to live in accordance with this transcendent, mysterious God's revealed law or covenant. And religion is, is our response, is, is kind of a natural response to try to develop systems, to try to, try to develop habits of thought, habits of of ritual and practice that will help us all and communicate to others the best way to live in accordance with that law or covenant. <clears throat> so, um, so early on in the, uh, in the, let's say, confrontation of uh, these two traditions, um, Tertullian has a, a famous line where he says, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? So, so if, you know, as Tertullian had, if, if you accept, let's say, the cr Christian revelation and say uh, that this is true and, and, and that we should follow uh, the, we should follow Christ, we should follow the way of Christ, we should follow what is, what is called upon us to do in, in the, both the Old Testament and the New Testament wherein that's revealed, then what is the value of pagan learning? So what is the value of the, the Odyssey that we read? What is the value of reading the Aeneid? What's the value of reading Plato, Aristotle, the Greek philosophers? Um, and the other aspect of that question is, so what's the value of pagan learning? So those texts, but also the faculty of reason with respect to a revealed word. Like if the answers are here, what do I need to do? A, is there a role for human reason in order to work out answers? Or is it just to turn um, mechanically trying to find the right reference and just follow blindly what's on that page? Okay. So that, that was a problem. Well, it still is a problem. It's still, it's still a tension, let us say. But those are two fundamental aspects of the question. Um, the first uh, uh, well, first of all, I'll just point out, as I say in the second bullet here, that Christianity was already, to some extent, I, I'm, I'm saying that there's a Judeo-Christian tradition over here, but the Christian New Testament is already has some has some influence in it from from Greek thought. So there's references in there to Thucydides, Plato, uh, subtly in there, but kind of the the uh, the soul of the thinking, so to speak, the soul of the disposition in the New Testament is, 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 is building on the, the, the Hebrew Bible and the Hebrew tradition. Um, so in the second and third centuries of the common era, they, uh, they, Christians had a number of different interpretations of how to resolve that fundamental problem about, okay, so what do we do with pagan learning and what do we do with the faculty of reason? So is there a role? Um, so for, for some, um, they could see in the pagan authors, so in a Virgil, for instance, uh, I think we even mentioned that, uh, but also in Plato, that, that people would see Virgil and Plato predominantly those two, and, but also others, as uh, Christians before Christ, I either certain, they may not have been conscious of it. They may not be, obviously they weren't, uh, um, they weren't, uh, the Christian revelation wasn't available to them. It came after their life, but they, they seem to be speaking a language that is consonant with Christian truth, uh, according to these authors, and could be read profitably as a different 
let's say, lends onto that Christian truth. So Plato's theory of particulars to forms uh, of, of, of trying to turn away from the world of this, these things to an essence seems to lead very well to, uh, let's say, a religious Christian way of thinking of denying the body and looking at a spiritual essence. Um, uh, of course, uh, Nietzsche even said uh, that uh, Christianity, he says this at the beginning of, I believe, of uh, Beyond Good and Evil. Nietzsche says that Christianity is Platonism for the people. So, uh, uh, so there, he's trying to underline these, these kind of connections as well. Um, so there's, there's that approach that sees pagan authors as, uh, as perhaps a way, to, a way of access to Christian truth, not an impediment, not a waste of time, definitely of a second order rank. Like, you know, there's the Bible here and there's Plato here, but it's worth reading Plato all the same. Others felt that if it's not, didn't have access to the divine revelation that is in uh, uh, the New Testament, if it didn't have access to that, that it can only lead us astray, that it can only be, let's say, at, 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 work, at, at the least a waste of time, at the worst something that leads us into error. Um, so the synthesis arrived at, as part of that first element that saw, uh, saw a role for it. So, um, or, or we might not have a lot of it classical texts available to us that might not have been preserved. So, <clears throat> so the, uh, according to the medieval synthesis, you know, the great philosophers can tell us where they want to go to tell people where they want to go, but they can't tell us how to get there. And, and the way is, is, through, uh, is through Christ and living with Christ. Um, and this is, is represented, I, I mentioned this when we talked about Virgil a, a bit, about uh, divine, Dante's Divine Comedy, which if, if, if there's one work that sums up medieval thinking, it's, although it's written late in the Middle Ages, um, written in the uh, 13th century, uh, it, it, it's the Divine Comedy. It's, uh, or, or maybe Augustine's uh, Confessions, also helpful, uh, but the, D Dante's Divine Comedy, I really recommend. Uh, so he has, as we mentioned, Virgil uh, there guide him through the inferno, so hell, so he's guided through there, and through up to the Mount Purgatory, so the first two books, so the Divine Comedy is three books, hell, purgatory, and paradise, so heaven. He has to go through all three to reach the truth, starts in hell and purgatory, Virgil is the guide for two thirds of the way, but he can't be the guide for that final leg. So to, he follows Beatrice for that. I'm gonna pass over this. Uh, it's not essential to what we're discussing, but it's, uh, it's just a, I like, to, I like to visually represent the tradition. I like to figure out where the influences are, but just a, to show how the Hebrew and the classical tradition comes together in early Christianity. St. Paul, again, as I said, had already read a bit of both of these. And then independently, this Stoic tradition had developed alongside, in, along in the classical tradition, and it became a separate influence into, let's say, medieval Christianity, St. Augustine and Boethius. The Stoics, a lot of so Stoicism is this basically this philosophy of um, uh, uh, I see actually I see it in the New Age or self help books now as Stoicism you know a Stoic thought per day book and stuff like that so people you know today's modern age you know anxiety because there's so much going on and and um, uh, what have you um, <clears throat> a way to uh, to combat that is let's say good good uh, a good grounding in Stoicism, which says, you know, we have to uh, begin with the things that we control. And the only thing that I control is my attitude to the world. I don't control any of the things in the exterior world. So rather than get upset and, and uh, invest myself in these things that I don't control, I can only, I should concentrate on what I do control, which is my reaction to my judgments of my apprehension of the world. So I can see 
Um, I can see uh, the pandemic we're living in as a curse to us all. 2020, you know, I, I see all these memes that 2020 is the worst year ever and, uh, and, and, and uh, whatnot. Obviously, whoever's saying that didn't live 1348 in Florence during the Black Plague. You know what I'm saying? Like the, there's, there's, it's whole orders of magnitude different. So, so they're the stoic approach rather than seeing that what's happening in the world uh, as something to lament and get invested about um, is to recognize it's events that I can't control. What I can't control is my reaction. I can see it as opportunity for changing one's life, uh, getting in shape, uh, getting a new routine of reading a book or something like that instead of doing the commute to work. So, so, so I know there's some people have tried to learn instruments, what have you. To, to, to profit from, from that. So that is very much a stoic approach of trying to guide one's uh, reactions to the world as opposed to being overly invested in the world. And that led directly into, let's say, the Christian ethos of world, let's say world renunciation in the sense of let's not be too invested in this world, okay? Um, <clears throat> so now I wanna to turn to uh, the dream of the rude, we'll start there quickly. Uh, but, uh, but first a word about the language. So I, I know when, uh, when we say Old English, everyone thinks, well not everyone, but many people think uh, Shakespeare is Old English. Um, but uh, Shakespeare is actually modern English. Okay, so that's a key, key distinction. And I know it, it may be small comfort for you when you're trying to read one of the plays, but um, uh, it's modern English. It's early modern English, but it's modern English. Okay, so it's 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 every aspect of the structure of the language is the same. The vocabulary is essentially the same. Uh, 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 there's nothing. There's no ver extreme variations in spelling, what have you. Uh, before that, it was preceded by Middle English, uh, and uh, which would be the language of Chaucer, and of course Old English. So what what happened? Um, so the Old English is the language of the uh, Angles and the um, uh, Saxons uh, that settled uh, in, Br in Britain, uh, starting in 450. So it's a Germanic language. It has cases, uh, so like Germanic, like like so like German. And like like Latin, actually, um, so their words will change if they're uh, depending on the case, but also the gender of the noun. These types of things, they have different symbols. Like you'll see here, there's a thorn. This this symbol here, and uh, this a e together. I forget what that's called. An ash, I believe. Um, so so there's different symbols. Uh, cases, gender to the nouns, and quite extreme vocabulary, word order is different. So it's essentially a different language. You have to, you know, when I was doing undergrad, if you, if you took Old English, which I did not, I'll just tell you right now, at the Old English language, I took Old English literature, but I didn't, uh, but if you took Old English language, that counted as the, as a second language you had to pick up, okay? Um, so this, these are the first few lines of uh, Beowulf, okay? So, uh, so in Old English, you can see it there, but uh, low praise of the prowess of people king of spear arms, Danes and days long sped, we have heard and what honor the eighthlings won. So that's a translation of what you see there. And then <clears throat> what happened uh, in 1066 and after 1066, we have this Germanic base of a language that uh, has introduced to it uh, Old French. So, so these Norman French conquerors become the aristocracy in Britain. And um, French is this kind of language of court. So um, when we look at English vocabulary today, uh, I, I forget the percentage, but a, a large majority of the words that we use in everyday speech are Old English, have Old English roots, okay? So the, and while all these words uh, have Old English roots. But then there's these, these kind of words that you might reserve for talking 
in a courtroom or in a class, more formal uh, encounter, uh, you would use, I believe encounter has a, is a Latin root. I, um, I'd have to check that. But there, people want to sound more learned. So they bring in these, uh, these aristocratic uh, French Latin words. So there's this kind of veneer of uh, <clears throat> French Latin vocabulary that are used in, in, in uh, in uh, predominantly in more learned contexts. And then English is, has, is very prolific in inventing new words. So it's picking up words all the time. So it, it's not just those two sources and it has evolved. So after the uh, Norman conquest and, and there's some blending and intermarriage for a hundred years, we start to have this, the beginnings of this what we could call Middle English. So it's this, it's this mixture um, of, of, of these two roots. And we start to see something that's more familiar to what we would understand as English. So you can read Chaucer untranslated. It's, it's a bit tougher, you need notes, but it's, it's definitely readable. So this is the first lines of the Canterbury Tales, the famous work by Chaucer. One that April with the Shard Sutta, the dracht of March hath pierced to the ruta. So there's, <clears throat> what's notable there is their vowels are slightly different there. The vowel sounds are slightly different. So there's, there's about to be a vowel shift where the vowel sounds would, would tend towards the way in which the vowels sound today in modern English. So the middle English retains these old vowel sounds that um, are closer to the vowel sounds in, in other European languages, uh, actually. So the 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 dracht of March or April instead of April. So it's not a April, it's April with his shal suta. So so uh, there's the, there's those vowel sounds. There's spelling differences, some minor vocabulary differences, and then of course modern English. The vowel shift has occurred. Uh, uh, our vocabulary has settled somewhat closer to what modern modern contemporary English is. And, and of course, to be or not to be, that is the question uh, from Shakespeare is, is entirely modern English. Okay. So um, this is a clip, maybe we'll read, we'll go through this. This is a clip I like of uh, <clears throat> someone who's reading um, the Lord's Prayer in both, in all three of those that I just described, modern, middle, and old English, okay? Because I'm not good at it, so I'll, I'll get a pro to do this. Uh, hi there, uh, my name's Hunter Reardon. Um, I'm an English teacher at- I'm just gonna pause it. Can everyone hear that? Can I get a thumbs up uh, or- uh... Yeah, I can hear that clearly. Okay, thanks, Jerry. All about to high school. Thank you. School in Palo Alto, California, and I'm going to do a reading for um, for everyone on the internet um, of the Lord's Prayer through the centuries. Um, and so I'm going to do I'm going to read the modern English version first, um, and then I'm going to go through the Middle English version, and then you'll get to hear the Old English version. Um, and you might find it really interesting how the versions of the versions of this text that has existed for centuries. Um, uh, change. And uh, I think the important thing here really is that they reflect um, some really important and interesting changes in the English language, while also showing how many of the words we use on a day-to-day -day basis are, um, have been in our language for a very long time. Um, and there's just a lot of history here that I think is fascinating. All right. Modern English. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Um, now the Middle English, um, just a moment here. Okay. Ura Father, that art in heavenus, hallowed by the name, the kingdom come to, by the will don, in earth as in heaven, Yuva to us this die our bread over other substanza, and for Yuva to us ora detes, as we for Yuvan to ora de Torres, and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Amen. And now Old English. Father, Ure, Thuthe Arton Hefonum, see the name Yahalgut, to be cumed in richa, geworthed in wela, an erdan swaswa on Hefonum, yonne gedang wamnichen la sule as te dai, and vergivas ure gilta swaswa vi vergivat un griteldum, and nugula tuas un kos nunge, ak aluses avivel. So richa. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name is. So, uh, what anesthesia said sounds like Latin. I think French referring to the Middle English. Yeah, I think there's there's probably some uh, similarities there in the, uh, in, as I said, especially in the vowel sounds there. So, that's uh, again a sense of the evolution of the language. And again, we're talking about Old English. It's not Shakespeare. Shakespeare was that, was that first one that was read there. It's, uh, it's really close to us. And, and what we're, we're talking about here is, is somewhat separated linguistically from us. So English, Anglo-Saxon poetry, so that's a language, poetry. So what are some features of this poetry? So it, it's an oral tradition. Uh, it, it was only when, when Christianity was brought over and this, this kind of scribal monk culture came that, that these texts were written down. But much like Homer, it would be uh, heroic tales recited around a fire or some sort of in the mead hall, heroic tales, uh, an epic such as Beowulf uh, recited from memory uh, with, the, with the, the oral tricks that, that, uh, 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 that the uh, uh, rhapsode would use in Greek, uh, very similar to that. Uh, another feature of the poetry we see here, uh, you can see on the right, this, this pause in the line, the breaks in the middle of the line are called sejuras. So it's a kind of a, a kind of an evident feature of, of Old English poetry. It's, it's uh, prevalent in, in uh, many of the poems. Um, alliteration, so alliteration is often used. So uh, repetition of consonant sounds to unite one half of the line to the other. And then this uh, feature called Kennings, which I really enjoy, where they'll take any two words, well, not any two words, but they'll take two, two nouns, bring them together to make a new compound noun uh, that, that becomes metaphorical and becomes this new image and, and a new way of thinking about something that may be common. So, so the one I, I like there is a whale road for the sea. So they took whale road, put it together and, and made a new compound noun, so to speak. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so in terms of genres, uh, so does everyone know what I'm talking about when I say genre? So genre is, is a kind or a type of literature, okay? So when I say that there's generic expectations, I'm in, in a particular literary form or literary genre, I'm saying that when we were reading epic, we we're reading epic of Virgil or Homer, there were certain uh, conventions, certain expectations. If you're reading that genre that you're gonna expect to see as you read it or hear it, if it's an oral epic, you're gonna expect a heroic journey. You're gonna expect battles. You're gonna expect what have you. And then there are different generic expectations or conventions in other genres. Um, so here's kind of a map of, of the major genres that there are out there. So the major distinction be, being between prose and poetry. So prose unstructured lines and then poetry is a basic distinction. That's overly simplistic, but poetry having some sort of structure to the lines. Um, not necessarily rhyming, not all poetry rhymes, but some sort of structuring to the to the lines. Um, now within poetry you can have narrative, lyric, or dramatic. Okay, so narrative, there's a story there, there's action, it unfolds, it has a longer unfolding than generally speaking than lyric, which is generally shorter, generally lacks narrative in the sense of a developed plot. Um, and uh, uh, lyric poetry will focus generally on individuals and emotions on a particular moment, um, uh, narrative on a broader cultural, political setting. 
uh, dr dramatic poetry, a uh, drama, obviously uh, can have a narrative, but the distinction is uh, it is uh, it's shown to us, it's not told to us. So remember we made that distinction at the beginning, the first lecture. So the so so narration is a told story. I'm telling you a story about an old man. Drama is showing the story. It's mimesis. So that is me presenting to you an old man or a picture of an old man and the old man going through the story and, and showing you the story. So those are the key distinctions there. In terms of old English genres, what we see is they had epic. Beowulf, I've mentioned a couple of times. If, if people have, if, if, you, if, you, if you've read it, uh, good for you. And if you haven't, I would say do so. I didn't want to put it in the course just for the sake of time. It was, it's a longer work, um, uh, but I do recommend it. Um, and uh, they also have lyric. We'll be reading, for instance, well, we read a dream vision, uh, the dream of the root, and we'll also, we also read an elegy, so the wanderer. Um, they did not really have, well, they had, to our knowledge, they had no drama. They did not, to our knowledge, have fictional prose. So these are the distinctions of prose. I didn't go over those, but prose can be in our modern distinction, fiction, nonfiction. Um, they didn't have any, uh, to our knowledge, fictional prose. They did have history that I mentioned, history of the ecclesiast uh, ecclesiastical history of the English people. So the, now to the structure of the Dream of the Rood, I'm borrowing this from Constance Hyatt in 1971, that's 50 years ago, that insight. That's okay, the poem's even older than that, so it's, it's still a relatively new insight. Um, so the, the dream, the, basically it has this uh, structure of a prologue, the speech of the rood that is, is in three sections and then the dreamer's epilogue. So this is the key thing about a dream vision is it's the, the frame is always the dreamer said, oh, I fell asleep in a pasture and I had this crazy dream. And then the crazy dream comes and is the, the lion's share of the work. And then an epilogue. And then I woke up and it was, and then, you know, I had to go back home because it was really late, you know? And then, um, <clears throat> But we're supposed to take from this dream vision. Usually, it's allegorical. These dream visions. Um, there's a, kind of an allegorical meaning. There's a literal level, and referring to a spiritual level, a, a Christian meaning. Um, here, the here the, that's definitely a play. But you don't have to do a lot of the mental gymnastics to to figure out the allegory because the rood, the cross, makes it very very clear. Um, and the dreamer's epilogue reinforces it at the end. Um, and as I, as I show here, there's kind of three parts to the vision that's talked about, the dream that's talked about. There's the history of the cross, so the, what happened to the cross, so I was chopped down. Um, let me back up first of all. So the, 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 the poem is a dream vision where the, the, uh, the narrator sees um, a vision of this cross that is, is referred to alternately as the tree from which it came. So it's a cross that was a tree. It's this bejeweled cross, but the other word for cross is rude. So you'll see that word, so it's cross, rude, tree, all the same thing. Um, so this, this cross that he has a vision of is the cross that Christ died on according to the vision. So Christ within, within the Christian tradition, the Christian myth, um, uh, died for humanity's sins. So Christ comes down, Christ is the son of God, comes down to earth, uh, uh, is, is prophetic, uh, has a, of, of an apocalyptic end, uh, is a, a faith healer of sorts, so to speak, but um, eventually the uh, the, um, the authorities have him tried and uh, uh, convicted to crucifixion for, for blasphemy of sorts, uh, for, for saying that he's the son of God, that he's the Messiah. So uh, 
this crucifixion dying uh, is the way to pay back the debt owed to God for the original sin of Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve uh, eat the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning of the Old Testament. Uh, this is the uh, Marx brings death into the world and uh, Marx kind of an infinite debt that we must repay to God, this breaking the relationship with God. Now we can't, we're too weak to pay this. We, all we can do is, is die our individual deaths. And, and uh, uh, so, so no one can really bear it for all of humanity except for the son of God. So it's the role of Jesus in, in this tradition. So um, Jesus willingly uh, let's say sacrifices himself for the sins of humanity, according to this tradition. Okay, so um, he sees a vision of the cross that describes. So this is the cross that Jesus died on in the vision, and he he sees how the you know the the cross is telling him how he was a tree. He was cut down. Uh, then he was brought to to where he saw this noble warrior christ and uh he uh he was forced to carry uh this uh christ on on him as they nailed the nails through him so here christ is becoming one with the cross so the nails are going through christ but it's also going through the root christ has to be stoically um withstand with a stout heart so to speak these crimes against him because he knows he has to do it for humanity so it takes a certain amount of bravery right according to to the root and so too does the rude have to stand up to this and not try to to stop it so that's the rude the crosses act of bravery so that's kind of the history that's described and then in the second part it describes kind of the glory that that arrived because of that. So, so there's that history that that's kind of sad. Like it was a, it's a, you know, it's the death of Christ. You know, it's this kind of the most humiliating way to die. The rude was stained with blood. But for the last thousand years, when, when this was written, let's say nine hundred years, um, since then there has grown this appreciation of the cross as a symbol. So the cross now comes to represent this glorious symbol of the triumph of the divine over evil and, and kind of the, the redemption of human souls in the face of, of, of fallenness. Uh, so that's the object of this second aspect of the vision. Then the third aspect of the vision is kind of a message to humankind. So just as the root or the cross was able to take on but kind of follow Christ and 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 gain through being stout, through being brave, following in the footsteps of Christ, so too can humanity get that uh, divine redemption, that glory by becoming Christ-like, by becoming stout-hearted. And then there's the dreamer's epilogue, which which again brings that home to to uh, kind of the lesson learned for the, for the individual, but for all of us. So uh, that's kind of a, a summary of, of, of the poem, but also the three-part structure of the vision. And kind of one thing I want to highlight, it, it has less to do with the temporal theme uh, of the course, but uh, uh, tied to the, let's say, the narrative aspect of the course in terms of the models of heroism. So what is what is it to do undertake a heroic act. So narrative usually has actors, agents, most, in, and traditionally they've been our hero, heroine that we're following, a protagonist, but what is it to have a heroic act? Um, the model of heroism uh, of these two cultures that are coming together, the Germanic and the, and the Christian are quite different, okay? So we have uh, an Anglo-Saxon worldview where, where where heroism is this traditional martial heroism of, of, of being brave in combat, loyal to my Lord by, by fighting to the death for that Lord and not backing down. Um, 
And the Christian one is a kind of an otherworldly philosophy that they had adopted, right? That this world's not worth really getting too messed up about. And let's let's devote ourselves to to heaven and to an afterlife. Okay. So I'm not going to be totally invested in the need hall and the division of wealth. And I'm not going to go thinking going to war to get more wealth and, and, and to share that wealth is really the best use of one's life. Okay, and it's not really the highest model of heroism. So, um, and then, so that's like the perspective of the Christians to the ger kind of Germanic worldview. And then the, from the opposite perspective, how are we supposed to take seriously like this Germanic, and from this Germanic uh, uh, people who, who valorize the exploits of a Beowulf defeating Grendel and, and these heroic exploits, how do I take seriously one who dies disgracefully on the cross? And how can that person be a hero for a warlike people is, is the kind of fundamental question. So, so as I say in that bullet there, so Christianity is a tough sell, right, for these people. So uh, the poem, The Dream of the Rude, really summarizes to some extent the way in which uh, that sales job kind of happened, it, it, how it takes Christian, um, Christian uh, uh, actions, actions of Christ, and puts them in a language of martial heroism, okay? So the, the poem displays uh, the ways in which Christian proselytes tried to make Christianity amenable to the warrior culture of the Anglo-Saxons. So even in his defeat, Christ uh, had to portray steadfast virtues of a warrior, warrior. And this is a quote from paragraph four there. So the hero young, he was almighty God, did off his raiment, stout of heart with valor. Uh, so, and that's just one example. If you go all through, if the adjectives around Christ are, are valor, stout of heart, the fixedness of, of, of of his resolve. So the act of passively sacrificing oneself here is portrayed as a glorious act of heroism for the people. Um, and the, and the, that glory is transferred to the cross and then can be transferred to, to the rest of humanity um, in, uh, if we become warriors like Christ, if we become steadfast. So that's the dream of the root and that I wanna kind of finish on the, the wanderer here. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk about the genre. We'll talk about this temporal theme of Ubi Sunt, okay? So the wanderer as elegy. So, uh, so Old English literature often confronts, um, uh, so elegy, first of all, is, is kind of a poem of lament, okay? <clears throat> so, Elegy is an important mode and genre. So mode as in a mood, let's say, as type of a type of literature, um, but also strictly a genre, a, a lyric poem of that, that is an elegy, <clears throat> is, is important for old English literature. They seem to, to confront squarely human mortality and transience of things. Whereas um, as Christianity became the dominant worldview, let us say, in English literature, um, you could always see in passing pointing to an eternal afterlife. In, in, there's less that sense in old English literature because you, Christianity is, is tenuous at best in that worldview. It, it's kind of being added on in some places. It's, it's an uneasy mix in some places. Um, here in The Wanderer in particular, very interesting poem because the body of the poem itself, or the 90% the of the poem seems to be about this wanderer whose worldview is very much a Germanic worldview of, of the hall is lost and how, where are they now, Ubi Sunt, right? Where are they now, my, the, my need giver, the Lord, my companions, they're all gone and it's all worthless. And then the last lines are a kind of a moral from the narrator, I guess, you know, saying, which kind of Christianizes it and says, this is what, uh, you know, what people think. And uh, 
you know, you have to be wise and figure out that not to get too attached to the world, basically, is, is, is kind of the epilogue at the end. Um, so that, that viewpoint is more of a Christian tag on at the end. And the wanderer's statement in the middle is more of a, this lament of transience in that it, it's lost and it can't be gotten back. <clears throat> so as I said, this ubi sunt motif is a, a motif is a, a, is a kind of a prevailing image or idea that, that, that goes throughout a work, okay? So, so uh, a motif uh, in, in literature is, is that kind of a, a theme or an idea that you can trace throughout. So ubi sunt is a motif that you can see in different works of literature. Um, and in Latin, it literally means where are they or th that or this or whatever. So where are X? So this is uh, from, from the Wanderer lines 88 to 96. He who deeply considers with wise thoughts this foundation and this dark life, old in spirit, often remembers so many ancient slaughters and says these words. Where have the horses gone? Where are the riders? Where is the giver of gold? Remember the, the role of the king as the giver of gold, the giver of, giver of the boon of whatever conquest. Here are the, where are the seats of the feast? Where are the joys of the hall, where, the mead hall? Oh, the bright cup. Oh, the brave warrior. Oh, the glory of princes. How the time passed away slipped into nightfall as if, as if it had never been. And so there's that sense that it, it slipped away and now has gone to nothing. Okay, so transience arrives at nothing. Now, as I said, in the Christian context, um, that would lead to a joyous awakening. So that kind of realization of the nothingness of transience frees one to a spiritual directedness that, that where one can direct oneself to what's more eternal, okay? Um, here, there's no turn to anything more eternal. There's just this gazing at the abyss of the fact that transience means that things slip away and might as well have never been. Why, why did they even exist? What, what was the point of them even existing? Now, <clears throat> I'll just uh, kind of close that on this to point out this ubi sunt motif. Many of you, I would imagine, they raise a, a show of hands if people read Hamlet. Just want to get a sense if anyone. So we do have two hands, three hands. Okay. So people have read this. That's good. Just want to keep checking, you know, because you never know if, if these things fall off the, the, the core curricula these days. Um, so Hamlet has uh, this, this scene from Act 5, Scene 1, um, where Hamlet is uh, in the graveyard um, watching some grave diggers. And uh, they're kind of... <clears throat> pulling up some skulls and what have you. And they're going, oh, and the grave diggers are making jokes and Hamlet watching along with Horatio there. And then they discover, he dis they discover one, they mention one that, that Hamlet knew that his old, his old jester York. So it's a famous scene from Hamlet, okay? Famous scene from a famous play. So whenever it's, it's acted, it's, it's got Hamlet holding that skull and that's a perennial image for Hamlet. So, Hamlet with this momentum mori. So momentum mori is a reminder of one's death. So reminder of our mortality. So he's holding the skull. Hamlet facing our mortality, such a perennial image of Hamlet. Um, so in, in this scene, he's just picked up the skull and he's kind of contemplating it and has this kind of famous speech. And I'm just drawing your attention to it as a very famous example of this ubi suit motif that we just saw in the wandering. Alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. 
He hath bore me on his back a thousand times, and now how bored in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed, I know not how, know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chap fallen? Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come, make her laugh at that. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> again, as I said, uh, kind of a powerful, powerful example of Ubi Sunt. I think the wanderer is another powerful example of that, this person wandering alone for it seems like years wandering alone in exile. He used to pining for a home, let's say a communal mead hall with his companions, sharing those uh, benefits of, of, of companionship, of, of, of warm, warm living. You know, like he has to, it also mentions in the wanderer, he's, he's, he's got to breathe the cold. He, you know, it's just a cold existence. Um, uh, there, in, in Hamlet, uh, there's some pointing to, let's say, a Christian resolution. Maybe it's, it's, there's differences of opinion there. Uh, in the wonder, as I said, there's in the epilogue, there's a sense of trying to pull a moral out of that. But in those words that we have just of the wanderer, there's very, very little, very, very little salvation from that, very little recompense, just kind of a, a, that lament, that lament of things are gone and the significance and meaning of their having been is gone as well. So, with that, I'd like to uh, end the lecture on on old English literature and uh, and and open it up for if there's any questions or comments on the works that we just discussed. Okay, so seeing none, I'm going to wish you all a very happy reading week and I'll see you back the week after to discuss uh, Shakespeare's science. Thank you very much. Thank you.